And as you all heard, both secretaries mentioned and other speakers over the past two days the importance of updated and accurate information and data to our country and our world. And so we have a terrific set of speakers here who are going to explore just that, issues in precision agricultural and big data. And leading that discussion is David Muth, Senior Vice President of Ag Solver Incorporated. Did we get the mic going? All right, here we go. So it is, uh, it is my absolute pleasure and honor uh, to uh, bring this session to interact with these folks. We've got an, an exceptional panel uh, to close out the day, and I think we're going to have a very interesting conversation. Uh, our session's titled Precision Agriculture and Big Data, uh, The Next Frontier. This, I've got to say, uh, Secretary Vilsack fires me up every time I hear him too, and he actually had a really interesting lead-in uh, from my perspective as he closed out talking about the, the next generation and what we can do. I'm an Iowa farm kid. I grew up 100 miles north of here uh, and became engaged in the agricultural operation uh, in the 90s where this vision for precision ag started to have some, some real content added. I think back then the vision maybe said we were going to be just sitting in our offices by now and not really actually still going in the field, but that's a, that's a different topic. And I came through Iowa State, trained uh, in engineering and saw a, a lot of the development as we went through there and have spent some years in the R&D side of precision agriculture around bioenergy systems, uh, including some time in Washington, D.C. around public data and uh, understanding the importance uh, of those resources and most recently have, have started a precision egg uh, company uh, just north of town here. So this conversation gets very exciting and understand through that evolution that now's the time where we're really going to start to see some interesting changes come around. Uh, so I really invite everybody to take a few minutes and, and read the full bios uh, for our panel. It's really a very accomplished group. Uh, we'll just very quickly uh, work through and give a, a, an introduction quick. So Mr. John May is the president for Agricultural Solutions and chief information officer for John Deere. He, uh, he's been with John Deere since 1997. Uh, he's got an impressive and I'm sure very challenging role of enterprise-wide leadership for information technology, the Intelligent Solutions Group, which is a organization within DEER that's doing important, very important things for companies like uh, mine. Uh, and, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get into that just a little bit. And John Deere Water. Uh, Dr. Claudia Garcia is a senior director for global market access with Elanco Animal Health. She has over 20 years of experience working in animal health. And we've heard a lot about talent development. One of the really interesting roles that I, I saw in her bio is uh, that she's had is selecting and developing talent. Uh, and, and that is critical. We, I can say from experience that uh, this industry really is going to be all about the people. Mr. Kerry Preet, he's the Executive Vice President of Global Strategy for Monsanto. He's led Monsanto through over a billion dollars in acquisitions and uh, strategic partnerships. Uh, to develop new technologies and deliver new capabilities to farmers uh, across the globe. And Dr. David Gebhardt, he's the Director of Agronomic Data and Technology for Winfield. He grew up on a farm in southeastern Minnesota where his three brothers are still farming. I have to interject. Southeastern Minnesota and northeastern Iowa are, are probably some of my, my favorite place. Uh, it's beautiful country, trout streams, fly fishing. If you can make it, do it. Uh, and uh, Dr. Gebhardt is, also leads Winfield's National Answer Plot Research Program. So to introduce this discussion, what we really need to start with is uh, getting to a unified or consistent definition of what precision ag is. Uh, our definition, in, in very simple terms, is really the process, the whole process of changing the scale of decisions so that we can maximize productivity per unit of input requires high resolution data, the big data piece of the discussion. It requires high resolution control systems and it requires decision making tools. We're about two decades in right now. We've seen a lot of work on building that data, building those control systems and we're seeing a lot of activity right now around the uh, uh, improved decision making tools and I think we'll learn quite a bit about that from our uh, panel today. So our, our first topic is we'll go through uh, each member of the panel and, and get that perspective on what precision ag is and, and a little bit from their perspective on 
uh, how and why farmers are engaging precision ag uh, right now as we're seeing it emerge. So we'll start with Dr. Gephardt. Uh, he brings an interesting perspective with his dual roles as a technology developer and a uh, farmer. Thanks, David. So uh, first of all, I do want to thank the World Food Prize uh, Foundation for having me here. Um, as a farm kid that ended up roaming the halls of Borlaug Hall on the University of Minnesota campus in St. Paul, uh, picking up a couple of plant breeding degrees, uh, this is truly a very special uh, occasion for me to be here. And, and, and you're the best audience of all because you're here at 4.30 talking about data. So thank you very much. Really appreciate that. Uh, but let me, let me just start like this. Uh, historically, you know, I think David hit a couple of good points. I mean, Precision Farm has been def defined by a lot of its uh, technology, GPS, yield mapping, soil sampling, um, putting a lot of those things into variable rate uh, systems, looking at management zones. And from a farmer's perspective, I think the, the beginning of, of Precision Ag was focused on, on cost savings. More recently, things like uh, remote sensing or active sensing, crop modeling, um, weather prediction and simulation, which I'm sure Carrie will touch on. You know, these things have all now been added into the Precision Ag toolbox. So now, we, once we have all of, the, uh, all of the management zones created, we have an understanding of the field, there's been a lot more focus more recently on in-season management. The, uh, we talked, I heard many times today, the genetic potential. We need more genetic potential. We, in corn and soybeans in the United States in particular, we have incredible genetic potential. So we need to implement these, these tools. So uh, I guess the, the bottom line, whether you're a farmer or a technology guy, I, I really think the overall bottom line uh, uh, definition of precision farming is the same. We want to increase farmer uh, productivity and profitability. We want to you know, produce more food for the world. Uh, we, but, we, but we also want to do it in a way that is going to leave the land either at a minimum the same or maybe even improve the land as it goes. I mean, in, in corp, more corporate speak, put my corporate hat on that, and that's sustainability. But from a farmer's perspective, you know, farmers really do care about the land. And I think they do want to implement technologies to produce more food and also take care of the land. Precision conservation is a word that's fitting very well with precision agriculture right now, and I think that they are inherently coupled. I mean, efficiency means uh, that we're uh, improving environmental performance also. Mr. May, your definition of precision ag. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks for including uh, John Deere in this panel discussion. It's great to, to be here and to participate and also to be here with uh, such experts in the industry. So the definition of precision agriculture is, is actually quite difficult because, and the reason I say that is it has to do a lot with where the individual producer is from a technology adoption standpoint. So if you think of it as a continuum, and you go on the far end or the early adoption phase, some of our customers around the world, precision agriculture may mean simply mechanization. It may mean going from hand planting crops uh, to using a planter that allows them to control depth, control spacing, and control density. So to that grower or producer, that, that's precision technology. Of course, on the very, very far end, or the uh, far end of that perspective, there are, there are growers uh, that are using uh, the most advanced uh, guidance systems, varying rates at the individual row unit, whether they're planting or doing applications, streaming data between vehicles, streaming data on a real-time basis to web-enabled devices so they can make de better decisions. So it's, it's a broad continuum. And just to put that in perspective, that continuum isn't country-based. You can go into several countries and see that continuum existing. Let me give you an example. Today, we sell our most advanced guidance systems in 85 countries around the world. This year alone, we've started selling guidance advanced guidance, so this is the latest technology in, in 10 new countries in Africa. So that continuum exists across the world. But regardless of where you are on that continuum of precision agriculture, the benefit to the grower is you're going to become more productive and you're going to be more profitable. And that's critical. And for those of you that have read the recent GAP report that came out, we still have a lot of work to do on productivity around the world if we're going to feed this growing population. So from our perspective, from John Deere's perspective, we believe precision 
agriculture is going to be critical to increasing that productivity. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Garcia, your perspective. Um, thank you for staying here and uh, to listen to us. Um, I'm from Mexico. I have an accent, so I'll be the second Mexican in the panel um, that you are going to hear uh, from. For us, the nine billion that we have to feed uh, in Elanco are reflected in the three billion people that are in emerging classes. Those individuals in China, in Mexico, in Brazil, in India that will access for the first time uh, animal protein in the form of eggs, milk, poultry products, or uh, meat. Those three billion have to be fed and has to be produced in an efficient manner. So our definition goes connected or is connected to um, information technology, an information technology that allows a small farmer or a really big farmer to use the data to be able to understand how to use uh, everything in terms of inputs from water, pesticides, medicines, antimicrobials, vaccines, in a specific population, in a group of animals, or in a specific animal, at the right time, at the right location. Why is that important? It's because we are moving forward into an area where we no longer go and look at the population as one single block of animals, but rather we're looking at a more uh, specific therapy approach uh, with the support of a veterinarian or someone that can allow for that um, supervision and be more specific at what we do when we uh, uh, treat or take care of an animal. It's very important because it will allow them to be more productive, it will allow them to use less resources, and most importantly, it helps animal well-being, ensuring that animals are treated uh, correctly. That's, that's really important. I think uh, precision ag typically triggers thoughts of global positioning systems and maps. And uh, when we look at our system as a whole, uh, the animal production side is very consumptive and requires a lot of inputs. And so thinking about and broadening that context is important. Mr. Preet, can we get your perspective? Thanks, David, and it's uh, good to be here. I don't have a lot to add. I think that my colleagues did a great job of explaining it. Our simple way of thinking about it at Monsanto is um, it's a way f that growers can harness the variability that exists from a crop production in their fields, uh, the variability that um, uh, is driven by the single most challenging thing the farmer controls around the world, and that's weather. Um, and it's the convergence, and what's really happened is the convergence of information technology and big data analytics with the incredible innovation that you know, John's company is coming up with to execute a lot of those decisions, and, and then biology, and really understanding the biology of genetics of the soil and bringing that together. Um, you know, your, your question on the farmer, I think uh, any of us that have, that have farmed understand uh, the inherent variability that exists not only year on year, but uh, day on day, depending on the weather, uh, depending on uh, the variation within a field, and growers uh, forever have been trying to harness that, whether they're farming, you know, uh, 50,000 hectares in the Cerrados or, you know, farming one or two hectares of, of cotton or corn in India. They're trying to harness that, and they see and understand it, uh, and farmers that we've talked to around the world uh, want solutions for it. Thank you. So that, that was a great lead-in to, to our next topic, which we want to direct to, to Mr. May. Uh, as uh, coming, representing the, the OEM, the equipment manufacturer side, uh, often we understand Precision Ag as it is implemented on equipment for data gathering and the control systems that can implement our decisions. So how is your company supporting the advancement of Precision Ag, and what are some of the tools that you're providing for farmers? Absolutely. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, you know, regardless of where we are uh, with, with growers in the production, uh, you know, where I said on that adoption, technology adoption curve, if they're early in the adoption of technology or if they're a very advanced customer, uh, we, we're investing in, in trying to deliver a complete and world-class solution uh, for the customers. And the reason I say it that way is it's going to take multiple pieces to do that. Number one, it's going to take equipment. 
Uh, we're investing and continue to invest in developing uh, highly productive equipment that meets the specific requirements of our customers uh, where they're farming in the world. So equipment's uh, the, the, the first piece. Second piece of it is the technology, the technology that you mentioned, and, and we're investing really in three areas. The first area of investment is all around optimizing the machines. So when our customers purchase a machine, we want to ensure by utilizing technology, we can guarantee that they're getting the most out of that individual piece of equipment. How we do that, from a remote location, we can uh, diagnose the performance of the position. From a remote location, we can go on board and make suggestions of changes to settings, or we can just do that for the customer. The second area within the technology uh, uh, segment of our investment is around job optimization. We believe there's a tremendous opportunity to do exactly what Kerry was suggesting, is when our customers are completing jobs, we believe we can use technology to make them more efficient and more productive at that individual step in the production system. So for example, if you're planting, utilizing technology, uh, we can adjust the uh, flow or density of seed at the individual row unit. Uh, we can do that across the entire production cycle. So how do we help them optimize the job, give them the information they need to do it, or simply do it for them? The, the third area uh, is in agronomic decision support. Uh, we're investing heavily in sensing uh, capabilities that allows us to collect a tremendous amount of information, grower information, that allows them to make better decisions themselves or to share that data with their trusted advisors and have their advisors help them make de better decisions. So within the technology, it's all about optimizing the machine, optimizing the job, and providing agronomic decision support, so optimizing that side of it. And the third piece of it that you can't forget that's absolutely critical is we're investing in our dealer channel. Because after all, it's going to take an individual dealer, regardless of where we are in the world, to serve that customer, to make sure that that customer is up and running and having that conversation with that customer around what specifically do they need to advance their operations in order to be more productive and more profitable. Thanks. I think everybody here can agree, and certainly a lot of folks in, in the audience, that the strides that are being made on getting information seamlessly to and from equipment uh, are really valuable for all of our businesses and everything we're trying to do. Thank you. So our, so our next topic, uh, Dr. Garcia, we want to we dive in just a little bit further on the, the livestock industry. Uh, so with your background and expertise, could you give us uh, uh, maybe a little more perspective on precision ag in the livestock industry with animal health and productivity as a focus? Um, sure, I'm going to do that by using two or three examples that are simple and can uh, give you an idea on different production systems. Uh, in farmers that are small in scope or quite big. Um, the intention is always to look for a triangle of uh, um, metrics that we are looking for. One is behavior, so understanding how the animal is behaving and what are they doing when they are healthy or when they are sick and being able to identify when that behavior is changing, which is suggesting uh, whether they are under stress or they are getting sick. The second will be health, ensuring that those animals uh, are healthy and remain healthy during uh, the entire process and uh, that they don't enter the food chain sick or not being uh, medicated or treated if needed. And the third one is in terms of performance. Be sure that those animals can reach the performance that they are genetically geared into. And those three elements in that triangle have to be all in balance. So three very simple examples. One in Mexico with a program that we are running with Nestlé, uh, a program that we call GEM, Green, um, 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 
hold on a second, let me check, you know, I'm not make, making a mistake. Um, green, um, environmentally friendly meal production or meal management, and we uh, have farmers, small farmers in Mexico, in Veracruz, in the east side of the country, in which we are helping them by monitoring data to help them allocate the cows uh, in, in specific groups so they can feed them differently and they can treat them differently so they can increase milk production. That's a very small farm approach and they can increase their production by 50%, 52% by just allocating, measuring and allocating those animals together. If we go to farms that are quite bigger or much more uh, specialized with uh, more animals, we have a program that is called Vital 90 that is looking also in dairy. Those 90 days that go around the calving period that are critical for the cow. If you successfully can monitor in a, in a predictive risk assessment tool that farmers use with their phones or a tablet and they go and check different parameters, then they can ensure that those 90 days for the cow will be uh, correctly managed and they will produce to the uh, level that they need um, as they are expecting in their, um, in their production system. And the third one is one that uh, covers Africa. Uh, in a partnership with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Heifer International, we are uh, trying to uh, help families in Tanzania and in uh, an area around Tanzania to get dairy cows and to start dairy production by just teaching them very simple things of uh, uh, what kind of water they need, water filtration, feeding, how do you feed them, um, where do you put the feeder, etc. Very simple steps in terms of uh, technology that can help them initiate dairy production. So three different uh, scenarios that can help produce in different areas of the world. That is exciting and certainly very important. Uh, it, it hints around consumption and some of the, the issues that we have in agriculture. We, we've talked a little bit about conservation often. Precision agriculture is thinking a lot more about increasing productivity and maximizing output, but the, the minimizing input story is one that's very, very important. And so I'd like to go through each of the panelists uh, to, to maybe quickly get to uh, examples or statements about how uh, your companies and, and the industry that you're working in is seeing some of those examples around improved environmental performance. Uh, Mr. Preet, can we start with you? Yeah, we, um you know, as we think about um, precision agriculture, again, from a farmer's perspective, we would say that uh, in at least the major row crops around the world, again, this goes whether small farm or large farmer, there's anywhere between 40 and 50 decisions that a farmer makes every year in every field. Um, a lot of those decisions involve a application of inputs, um, fertilizer, water, um, crop protection products, seed, and uh, we think through the harnessing of an understanding the variability that weather has uh, on each of those decisions, uh, literally on a daily basis or on a longer term basis, you can start to optimize the inputs um, across the field um, and actually vary those to based on you know, current or expected weather patterns and start to draw some probability curves. So you know, as, as we think, and, and, and Dave said this, you know, we fundamentally believe that with the technology that exists today, the genetics that exist, the uh, crop protection products, the fertility products, uh, we can see uh, across most of the acres on the planet uh, a 30 percent increase. So you start to think about that and the ability to freeze the footprint of agriculture, um, and which we've talked a lot about here today at the various conferences. That is the, the uh, impact that uh, from our standpoint that precision agriculture can have. That's excellent. Dr. Gephardt, can you talk a little bit about this? Well, Terry took my answer, but that's, <laughs> a, that's okay. So I'll just, no, I just, I, what I would add to that is, you know, the tools that, that these, these gentlemen are bringing to the, uh, to the market, you know, in, in order to, to, really, to really implement them and see the, realize those, uh, that optimization of inputs, you know, uh, we've got this saying around Winfield that, you know, agronomy is local, right? So there are, there are awesome modeling, weather simulation, all these tools that, that, that need to be, you know, drilled down to a, literally a field level or within a field level. So, so some of the tools, you know, that, that we, we work with are, 
our hands-on tools, measuring tools. We do tissue testing. We do soil sampling. We, we do use uh, other types of sensing tools. You know, and, and those things together you know, really optimize all these different uh, opportunities to, to, again, you know, don't put your inputs where the crop can't consume it. And, but, but on the other hand, let, we, we do, there is a productivity message here as well. Let's, let's make sure the best parts of the field are, are getting what they need. So uh, I think that's just the ad that I would have to what Kerry said. You bet. Mr. May, any uh, uh, additions from an uh, equipment manufacturer perspective? I, you know, I think the, uh, the, the two answers really talked about utilizing uh, data that's coming off of the farm uh, to make better decisions. And, and, you know, I think you said it very well, put the inputs where they're actually needed. Well, from a technology standpoint, from an equipment standpoint, uh, one of the technologies that we've invested heavily in in the last 20 years is guidance. And when people think of guidance, they think of, of it as, uh, you know, the farmer sitting in the uh, tractor or combine, pulling a planter or harvesting a field without their hands on the wheel and maybe reading a magazine and relaxing. Uh, that, that certainly is a big benefit, no doubt, for those of you that have combined a field or planted a field. But, but the biggest benefit is uh, knowing the position of that vehicle. And once you know the position of the vehicle, uh, we have the capability of executing their expertise in the field, varying the rate uh, to, to address a microclimate within the field and maybe change the density of the seed on the planter based on what we're sensing in the field at that time, or adjust the uh, application equipment, make sure that we're not overspraying or underspraying, uh, controlling overlap, making sure that we're not overlapping rows, the benefit of that is not just on the input side, reducing inputs, reducing the application side. That has a tremendous environmental impact, but it's also compaction. It's the number of times you have to run over that field. You can reduce that. You can reduce the amount of tillage you need to do and, and reduce the overall uh, footprint on the field. So uh, we're, we're investing heavily, again, around that job optimization side to make sure we can take their expertise and, un and insight that they have and execute it in the field. Dr. Garcia, do you have any additional thoughts on natural resource impacts from the animal perspective? First, I want to say that you can actually also read a magazine while your uh, cows are being uh, uh, walking on their own, and there's a robot that can measure them, and they go and they uh, go to milk by themselves, and the machine can read whether they're ready and washes them and check them and sends everything to the manager or the veterinarian if they're sick, and if the milk is not adequate, it will get discarded. So it's, that is available too. Um, but I want to be sure that we are all um, clear to the fact that when we talk about becoming more productive or more efficient, we're not talking about gallons and gallons more of milk that are needed. If we were to produce 4.75 ounces more per cow, which is a glass like this one, more of milk, we, we could secure the needs of milk and calcium for the entire population in 2050. So we're not talking about a tremendous amount of milk. And it can be a cow in Mexico, in Africa, or in the US. So the average of the production of a cow globally is two gallons, and we're just talking about 4.75 more. All of us know very well that in animal production, water use and feed use is significant, and it has to be reduced. So the more efficient we are, the less water is used, the less land is used to, and that will have benefits of uh, saving not only water in, in an unbelievable amount, but also in terms of waste. You have more animals because you are not efficient and you are trying to produce more, you will have more waste to deal with, more water consume and more feed. And we really want to be sure that we um, optimize the genetic potential of the animals regardless of where they are. We can save water, and I have here one number. If we could save 66 million cows by 2050, we will uh, have 388 million fewer ac acres of land so the size of Alaska that we will not have to use to have animals, and or 618 billion, water, uh, billion gallons less of water, 
enough to source of water, 11 cities, the most important cities in the U.S. That's how important it is and why we believe that uh, animals have to be more efficient and more productive. Those are some amazing stats. I've got to put that in my back pocket and try and find, figure out how to use that some more. Uh, so, Mr. Pree, you talked a little bit about weather volatility and, and how that impacts this. Uh, we know your organization has been active in this arena. Can you talk a little bit more about how precision agriculture and big data in general can help us be predictive and then adaptive uh, to some of those volatility issues that we heard about previously? Yeah. Um, you know, I'll start with the, uh, even the you know, as, as we think about as a, a plant breeding company, um, we've been using data and big data capabilities to uh, develop some hybrids, corn hybrids and other crops that uh, can perform better in, you know, changing climate, drier conditions. We've now extended that and started to think about, um, you know, harnessing the inherent variability that exists um, over a year or literally on a daily basis. And the uh, capability the Climate Corp uh, corporation gave us was the ability to measure uh, weather and the environment uh, on a hyper local basis down to a field level, uh, the ability to uh, model weather um, and understand the uh, longer term uh, you know probabilities of certain weather events happening, and then the final piece is uh, taking and using you know data analytics and science to start to model the impact of agronomic decisions. It's back to those, David, 40 to 50 decisions and starting to understand what uh, a, uh, an overnight rainfall or a certain level of humidity or temperature will have on the probability, for example, of a disease to occur in the next three to five days. Um, and that's how we think that, uh, you know, as Dave said, there's a lot of genetic potential there. The key is to protect it and unlock it. And that's how we're starting to think about, you know, using, um, you know, big data and, and the modeling capability that the Climate Corporation is providing us to start unlocking some of those uh, answers to uh, how to apply products. And, and John's equipment that he's developing gives us the, the farmer the ability now to execute some of those decisions, what John, John calls job optimization in the field. And that's how really the convergence of biology uh, of equipment and, and information and big data come together. You bet we're certainly seeing an uh, impact when we, we talk and interact with farmers with uh, some of what that weather data and what that capability is, is putting out on the market. Uh, our next topic uh, moves into farmer adoption and then enabling policy. Uh, and, and we'll sort of move quickly given our time constraints through this. Uh, but, but the question that we want to work through is uh, what systems need to be in place to increase adoption in the use of uh, precision farming practices? And are there some clear uh, policy uh, ideas and concepts that can help enable that? Um, Dr. Garcia, would you start? Um, for us, it's very important, and uh, Secretary Vilsack said it, uh, is to have uh, regulatory systems that look at the information and the science and interpret the science and, and the data in the same way. And if more countries can use those same standards across, across the globe uh, and the same science, then I think we can all advance at the same time versus having different regulatory uh, systems or approvals and interpretation of, of the data. That's, uh, that's very important, it's critical. Uh, we can develop different subsets of approaches and interpretation, uh, even though it's important to understand that the uh, food basket in every country is different, but the more we can uh, set up the policies and the regulatory systems to do it, uh, um, in a more concise manner, I think we can all advance much more. Um, the other uh, piece that is very important for us is um, how we capture and manage the data. All of the policies that we put around privacy, but also how we keep and maintain the data of uh, big integrators or a farmer that has five cows, it doesn't matter, so that data is uh, managed correctly. Those two areas are very important for us. You bet. So one of the things we've realized is that farmers have become uh, very accustomed to information being provided attached to the other products they're buying, whether that be equipment, whether that be services, whether that be other kinds of inputs. Uh, Dr. Gephardt, how do you view adoption and, and what needs to happen to accelerate it? Yeah. <clears throat> 
far, farmers are kind of a funny bunch. You know, they, uh, we've got this saying around Winfield, and I see it at home, is it just happens. That's really the way that this whole data thing has to work. And, you know, again, we're, we're getting systems in place. System needs to come off the machine, needs to go into a cloud that an agronomist can access. The agronomist needs to bring that into his tools in order to do the agronomic analysis and recommendations and then send it back to the farmer so that they can execute it. And by the way, the farmer doesn't want to even know this stuff is going on. He wants to take his iPad or whatever, his device of choice, and take it into the combine, take it into the tractor and the planter, and all this stuff just happens. So that sounds really easy, um, and it's, but, it's, but it is very difficult. So one of the things I think we'll probably come back around to as far as policies or principles is, is, is around data and the, the data movement. And, and uh, right now, I mean, everybody has a cloud-based solution for data. And, and I think that's, um, that's an opportunity and a challenge. But the opportunity is that, you know, the, the, the companies are working together. Uh, Open Ag Data Alliance is one of, the, one of the initiatives I'm sure we're all aware of on this stage which really talks about the ownership of the data and how it moves uh, somewhat effortlessly from place to place. I, my analogy is uh, the financial systems. Uh, agriculture has been pretty good to me the last couple of years. I've actually gotten a bonus check every year. It goes into my checking account. I don't want to keep it there. I want to put it into my financial services account. So I go into that site, I log in, I go transfer the money, and within 24 hours I get a confirmation that very securely my money has gone from one place to another. How does that really happen? So there, there are, there are, there are uh, ways of, of getting that done from the, from the technology perspective. And you know, one thing about farmers, they may be concerned about their data, but they're much more concerned about their money. So if we can show that it works in the financial world, I think we can get, a, get them over the hurdle with, uh, with their data. You bet. We always, we always throw that in there, that if you provide value, then getting access to the information tends to not be a problem. We also refer to it as the auto steer dynamic, and maybe we need to blame the equipment manufacturers that they showed up with auto steer, and it was so easy that everything else now has to meet that same standard. <laughs> Do you want to talk about adoption a little bit, Mr. May? Sure. Uh, just a general adoption of, uh, of technology. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I think uh, if you can demonstrate value, like you said, in the technology uh, from, from the customer's perspective, uh, technology will adopt very fast. Uh, but I can tell you some of the lessons we've learned over the years is it's not about selling the technology itself. And I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the uh, technologies right now that's enabling all of this big data uh, that, that is the data that's being collected as you're going through the field through the entire production cycle. So you start off and you're preparing the fields, you're planting the fields, you're caring for the fields, you're harvesting for the field. If you take all of that data, it creates a tremendous, a tremendous data set that, that allows customers to do better planning or, or growers to do better planning. Telematics is really what enables that. It's a, it's a form of communication to take data that's locked on board on a vehicle and send it off board to a place where you can actually use it. You know, when we first uh, got into the telematics space, we, we tried to sell telematics uh, without a, a, a suite of products behind it. And I can tell you from, from an adoption standpoint, you've got to demonstrate the value for the customer around the specific job that they're doing. And if you can demonstrate that value, like auto steer, where you take the fatigue out of it, the adoption happens quickly. Mr. Pre, you, your organization's rolling out a lot of exciting technologies also. What, what do you guys see in terms of systems that need to be in place to get that adoption curve up? Yeah, I won't repeat what John and, and Dave said. I think the thing that we've seen is, you know, because um, a lot of these decisions are going to be made and impacted on what happened yesterday. And so the ability to have infrastructure that can move data quickly uh, in some of the areas uh, today are, you know, it's still a bit of a challenge. It's, it's built out a lot in the last few years. Um, but to be able to get that answer quickly and, and move data, as John said, um, it, it's got to get there quickly and it's seamlessly. And then uh, standards that could be in place. So you know, uh, different companies and organizations can use the data depending on where the farmer wants that data to go uh, so they can mine it and come back with to the, to the producer with insights. Uh, I think that's going to be one of the keys to uh, continue to see the adoption. 
So the final topic we'll cover, it actually falls right off, is uh, data privacy and ownership. And, and it's certainly a, a really significant issue uh, that, that we're all facing. Uh, we've talked a little bit about if we can provide value, we tend to be able to get access and, and share the information as it moves through. We talked about some of the alliances that are coming through. Uh, what are you seeing as the concerns that farmers and users of data are having, and how can we address those concerns? Dr. Gebhardt, if we could start with you. Uh, this is a great, con great question. So um, one of the things that uh, at, La at Land Lakes, we're a cooperative system, right? So our, the farmers we represent, several hundred thousand farmers, um, they're not only our customers, but they're our owners. So we, uh, we sort of have an extraordinary responsibility for their well-being, okay? You don't want to go, you know, you don't want to go uh, make your customers angry. Well, you sure don't want to make the people that, uh, that own you uh, have uh, any issues with what you're doing. So we, we think a lot about their well-being and a lot about their data and, and what, they, what they own. So one of the things we're, we're looking at in order to kind of get our arms around this whole issue of data privacy and, and data ownership, first and foremost, I think we all pretty much agree here that the, you know, the, the data is the farmers and they need to have control, control of that. But again, farmers are very suspicious. They're very suspicious of organizations taking their data and going off and doing something that will come back and negatively affect them. So one of the things that we're looking at is as a cooperative system, We'll, we are in the, in the process of build, building a completely OATA compliant uh, uh, cloud-based system that they would, could participate and have their data in. And if we would happen to come up with some way to monetize that uh, through other opportunities, you know, they would actually participate in that just like they participate in, uh, in the value of all the other products that they buy through us. So, so that's one way of kind of maybe uh, alleviating some of the concern around data privacy and ownership. If there's value there and somebody creates it in our system, you know, they would share in that value based on their level of participation. That's a model that they, that they work on every day. So that, that's one thing that we're, we're considering. Mr. May, what are you seeing as the concerns and how are you uh, dealing with them? You know, it's a, it's a lot of what, what's been said. It's certainly, you know, two areas. It's the ownership and it's the security. And one of the, uh, our focus is uh, to live by our, our data principles. And really our data principles are structured around three, uh, three main areas. Number one is we want to uh, provide data to the grower that actually is valuable, just like we talked about, that they can do something with it. That, mean it. that means it has to be very easy to use and it has to be very accessible at the point where they want to use it. The next is transparency. To exactly your point, uh, the customer wants to know where that data is being collected and where it's going. That's a key pillar in our data principle. And the last is control. And it's probably the most important from the grower's perspective. We give the control to the grower. And we let the grower make the decision uh, where they want to share that data. And to do that, we've tried to develop a very open platform uh, where we've already connected over 120 companies. And these are business advisors. They're agronomists. Uh, they're the leading uh, 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 you know, application seed type companies. And by connecting those uh, companies, those trusted advisors uh, uh, to our customers, that allows a vehicle for them to make the decision if they want to share that data with those trusted advisors, allow them to add value to it, and then transfer it back. So again, it's value, it's being very transparent, and it's being very, very clear on the ownership side. Mr. Preet, do you have any closing thoughts on data privacy? You know, just I, I won't repeat. I, we are at the same place as what was mentioned here in terms of the, you know, the grower owns the data. The, they get to determine how the data is being used, and they absolutely have to be convinced, and they should be uh, absolutely uh, confident that the world-class data security measures are being taken to protect it. Um, you know, I think the other thing, and this gets this, this back to the speed issue, um, the ability to move data quickly and move it seamlessly to wherever they want it to go so it can be um, looked at and, and uh, mined and, and answers coming back to them that help their operation. I think that's the other thing that growers are really looking for that, um, you know, doesn't have to go through, you know, a bunch of reformatting and other things because uh, that means time and uh, it may mean lack of, you know, ability for 
uh, companies or organizations or their agronomists, wherever they want it to go, it can get there quickly and get interpreted so it can get back to their farm. Yeah, back to the auto steer dynamic. <laughs> so I do think we have time for one or two um, fairly quick questions uh, for the, the panelists. Yeah, I'll have a question. Uh, Patrick Benz from Seattle, Washington. Uh, very interesting hearing about all the impressive modern technology and systems that you're bringing to the market. Uh, it appears that the immediate applications of these new innovations are going to be for large-scale modern farming systems. Um, we hear often at these conferences that at this far, far end, the subsistence and above subsistence level farmers looking at uh, bottle caps and uh, microdosing as their version of precision ag. I'd be interested in knowing your thoughts or some suggestions or where things are going with precision ag technology in terms of handheld devices, uh, soil testing kits, uh, smart, not smartphone, but some kind of mobile device decision support system services that would be appropriate for the smallholder farmer who has maybe 50 hectares, or a community knowledge worker who is working to assist an entire community with best practices. Um, I'd be interested if you can have some, some share some ideas about that. Any panelists want to tackle that one first? Take a shot. That you know, it's a very important point as we think about um, where the increased productivity has to come from. It has to come from a lot of smallholders around the world, in addition to um, you know, in some of the developed areas. You know, um, we see that happening already. Um, we've got a, had a program now in India for several years, where um, you know, John kind of mentioned that at the start, the one end is where a lot of um, producers in India have cell phones. Um, not quite yet to the smartphone, some of them have. We have been, um, you know, interfacing with those producers directly over the cell phone, giving them precision egg, if you will, information or insight based on um, moth flights in cotton, based on what's happened with the local weather and the, you know, anything they could be doing to improve, you know, their agronomics. So it's happening already. I don't think we're too far away from you know, at some point getting uh, maybe smartphones in their hands so they can be taking pictures of a plant, uh, having that picture looked at uh, to know whether that's, uh, that plant is under some kind of uh, fertility stress or disease stress, and then a solution coming back. Um, and then as you start to think about sensor technology and how quickly that's evolving on a small scale, I think uh, th that'll be the next one where you're getting that information remotely and you don't have to wait, you know, for a picture to come or a or a text to come. So I, that, that's going to come pretty quickly and uh, it, it's going to unlock uh, a lot of productivity in, in those areas. Any additional thoughts? Quick. And to that, I, uh, you know, I go back to that technology curve that I, that I referenced and, and uh, uh, John Deere, you know, like Monsanto, we, we have uh, uh, lots of uh, relationships in these developing markets where we're partnering in some cases with uh, 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 not just the grower itself, but, but the local government to try to increase the mechanization. Because even just the basic introduction of, uh, of a planter can mean significant, significant impacts on productivity. Uh, for example, we have a, a joint venture in uh, uh, Africa where uh, we're working on uh, developing, increasing the yield in malted barley. And it happens to be with a brewery where the brewery provides the seed genetics, the, pro the appropriate seed to do that. And then we've mechanized the system with a, with a simple uh, planter uh, and a tractor and have seen tremendous increases in not only yield, but the quality of the product that's actually produced. And I personally went and visited one of those fields and I stood there with the farmer and looked at one side that was hand broadcast and the other side where we ran the new system through and it was night and day. So uh, although I talk about these large advancements and these, these you know, technology leading customers, uh, John Deere also works uh, on a daily basis around the world serving customers that are very, very early in the adoption phase of technology. I think Dr. Garcia had one quick thought. Quick one, seeing animal production, uh, there are now uh, utilization of cameras that can monitor the temperature of the animals so you know either um, 
their temperature is changing and, and then suggesting, hence suggesting that a disease could be occurring, and that's externally. Internally, uh, when you interact with an animal, you can have precise therapy now that allows a cow that has mastitis to be treated without antibiotics, which I think is very important. We're getting very short. Maybe one more quick question. Or if, two more. <laughs> two. All right. uh, I'm Jennifer Bernhardt. I'm Associate Dean for Research in the College of Engineering at the University of Illinois. And um, thank, thank you for all for being here. So, so a lot of the discussion has been about precision, precision agricultural and how it's been around for 20 years, as you said. Uh, big data has sort of been around for a lot less. And this, one of the challenges we have as, as uh, uh, folks who want to bring big data to the forefront is actually having student access to data sets. Now, I understand farmers own the data from their, from their farms, but what have, you know, you have some very large companies on the, on the, on the stage here. How can, how can we work together with universities to put these kinds of ag big data sets? Because I think, you know, the Amazons of the world, the Googles of the world are providing data sets for students to work on to get them excited about their fields. How can, how can, how can agricultural companies whether it's on, on production or machinery, how can they get their data sets in front of our students so that they get excited about that aspect of ag? Do any of the panelists have some programs they'd like to introduce? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just mention a couple things from Winfield. I mean, we have, uh, you know, the, one, the great thing about this audience, I think most of them left now, but all the young people, you know, that, yeah, they were here. They, they, they need to hear this, right? No, we, uh, I mean, we have, we have such an extensive intern program, associate program, also fellowship programs. And, and what we've talked a lot about is we, uh, we have a lot of that data, right? We have access to millions of acres, all that kind of stuff. Um, under the right kind of agreement, under the right kind of work, working to, to help one of our issues, which is people. So you could, you know, that's, that's the collaboration, I think, that, that, that you're maybe alluding to. And, you know, we work with Dr. Bilo at the University of Illinois, and I think these guys do too. I mean, we have some fellowships already in place, but, but that's an area that we're, we're definitely, we, we've grown that immensely to try to, it's not just around the technology, but it's always about the people that know how to position it and use it. So that would be the one thing I think that we would see as a short-term opportunity is, you know, combining, you know, we bring the data, you bring some expertise in the people, and, we, and you make something happen that way. That would be a, a pretty quick, a, a quick solution. Anything for teaching? For teaching. So instead, instead of, you know, in a more open way. Yeah. So, so just, again, uh, we, some of our software that we, we uh, have, we're, we're developing sort of academic student kind of versions of those types of things. I'm sure that's, there's probably other things out there as well. So, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, we'd be open for that. I mean, we're, we're not the, the big generators of intellectual property on the stage here. We're more the consumers. So our data does tend, unless it's farmer data, but our, our data tends to be a little bit more uh, usable and open. But uh, that, that would be a very good opportunity. Next question. Hello. Yeah, my name is Ratnesh Kumar um, with Iowa State Electrical Engineering. And uh, so I have two related questions. First, uh, you know, talking about precision agriculture, how precise should a precision agriculture be? Uh, where do you think is the sweet spot between the resolution that the precision agriculture needs versus the cost it takes to do so? And, and the second question is, uh, we, we talk, the overall goal is, of course, uh, resource management and, and imp improved productivity. And, and a lot of it has, uh, has happened in terms of uh, uh, doing genetic engineering in, 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 in achieving that. Uh, what are the kinds of problems that you think where engineering together with genetic engineering can come together to solve issues in, in precision agriculture? I'll quickly respond. On how precise, we, we use what we call a usefulness metric. So it, we don't have to be any more precise than what's useful for making a better decision. And that's not a great answer in terms of something uh, highly numerical that you want, but uh, that's a pretty good rule to apply uh, because you can, as you said, continue to dig and dig and dig in a way that uh, the return just doesn't come there. Uh, any of the other panelists like to address? Healthy animals, that's how precise for us. 
ensuring that the animals are healthy and that behaviorally are um, feeling well. And, and I think we maybe have one more question. Um, hi, I'm Paul McGarvey. I'm from Des Moines. I'm an investment banker uh, focused uh, specifically in the precision egg. Uh, and so my question is more from an M&A standpoint. And again, this is more the innovative technological uh, companies uh, on the collection analysis and also the decision making or uh, prescriptive uh, uh, tools and services that uh, companies provide. Uh, question, and I, I understand Monsanto with its uh, purchase of Climate Corps, Precision Planning, and Solem up here in, in, uh, in Ames. H how active are you folks um, in, in looking at the market, uh, not only for individual platforms to drive revenue, and, uh, 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 but also R&D, to pull information? And, and I understand the end game uh, the Holy Grail's data, uh, big farm data. But I'm, I'm interested from a strategic corporate big company, um, how do you look at that? Uh, is that an active endeavor and uh, uh, is that, and I suspect that that is an active, but uh, what's the reach that you folks are doing in the market in terms of looking for those earlier stage uh, and technological companies that allow you to grab big data? Several questions in one. Um, uh, here's how our view is. I, I think if we, you know, look out in the future, uh, five, ten, fifteen, twenty years, and we're we're, we're on this in this room, and um, you know, I think there's going to be a, a, a several sets of businesses around precision ag because you know somebody said at the start this is a big area. Um, I think you're going to see businesses around data transmission, data collection data storage, data security, and compute power. There, there's going to be businesses around that. Um, you're going to see businesses um, around devices. It's going to be sensors. It's going to be instrumentation um, that are going to provide these. There's going to be businesses around analytics, uh, you know, companies that can take these uh, various sets of information and turn them into insights. You know, John's company has doing, been doing precision ag for a long time, and, you know, adding technology to execute many of the insights that are going to happen. So I, I think is from our perspective, you know, we think our area of expertise um, is really understanding the analytics piece as it, as it relates to the crop agronomy. We're not <laughs> in Claudia's area, but we're, we're, that's where we think, uh, you know, our area of expertise lies. And it's helping also you know, get access and, and look at ways where we can get insights around some of the biology, um, whether that be soils, uh, plants, the, uh, the weather, and, and bringing that together. And then we see ourselves partnering with other companies who have the expertise in the other areas, like equipment, um, like some of the sensor technology uh, instrumentation. That, you know, other companies are going to be the best at that, and then companies like Dave's company to help deliver that to the farmer. So that's where we uh, see ourselves, uh, you know, and, but, you know, I don't think, uh, well, it's not obvious that, uh, you know, a single company is going to be able to put all this together. It's going to be a series of partnerships uh, to uh, put this together to get the right solution, the right insight back to the grower. I think that's a, a great lead into the, the closing example I wanted to give that basically we talk about the next frontier, but uh, we're seeing it. And we had several uh, really sophisticated in-season nitrogen management tools all hit the market this spring. They're different. They're from different kinds of organizations. They're from different backgrounds, but they all help make a better decision around how to manage your nitrogen directly in this exact construct where we want to get more output, more productivity per unit input. And we're seeing that happen and I think that trajectory and that trend uh, is, is going to continue in a big way. So with that, I'd like to, to thank our very excellent panel. Thank you to the audience that, that stayed with us and uh, thank to the World Food Prize for facilitating.